Hello and welcome back to the show. I am so excited to be here. I'm glad that you are here with us. I have missed being in this space with you. Obviously, we had to take a small pause to recording the show. Uh, you know, that hurricane swept through our area, disrupted a few things, but we are back. And I would like to let you know that our producer and his family are doing just fine. So uh, thank you for rejoining us here in this space. My name is Charles Williams. I'm just one half of the duo that makes up inside the principal's office. I am a current assistant principal here in Chicago, as well as the founder of CW Consulting, the host of the Counter Narrative Podcast. But right here is one of my favorite spaces to be. Mac, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Charles? I'm excited, but mostly because I get to share this space with you. And then I'm hanging out with Hedrick again. That's always amazing. And I made a new friend, Nicola. So it's like... This is amazing. So it's going to be a great Saturday, even though it's it, like almost freezing here in Chicago. It's almost freezing already. Well, we're in Texas, so we don't have that part, uh, that problem yet. But uh, I, too, enjoy this community that we are building, a community of leaders. Uh, we are engineering and creating a space where leaders can gather, be vulnerable, talk about things that are so important to us and to the things that we do for kids so that we can do those important things to move forward. And that is to reflect on our practice so we can refine our practice. Mm -hmm. and I believe that when we learn more as adults, kids learn more. So I'm glad to be here. My name is Mac. I am a former uh, principal, uh, elementary principal for 20 years. And now I have the pleasure of traveling the country, helping principals, coaching principals and teams uh, for Solution Tree, an education, uh, K-12 education company. And so I am so excited to be here. I'm excited for our guest. And we want you all to introduce yourselves to our audience. Well, not our audience, to our friends, to our community members, to the members of our village. Ms. Nelson, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, thanks for inviting me along today. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Nicola Nelson. I'm a head of school. Um, I've been in education for almost 30 years. I've been a head teacher of four different schools. I'm currently living in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, originally from the UK. Been here for three years. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me along. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Hedrick Nichols, and I am an author, consultant, ed tech specialist. I love it when, love it when it's up there because I can, I wear so many hats. Sometimes I can really get them all out without the 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 the, the, the stammering. Um, also privileged to not only serve my district as an ed tech specialist, but to be able to go out and help districts and leaders with some of the issues that they're seeing in their classrooms and on their campuses. And uh, yeah, loving that life. Excellent. Well, thank you both for being here today. I know that we're going to have a very robust conversation. Yeah. Now, now that I know Nicola, that you are I sh now in my mind, I'm like, we should have invited Lee to specifically join us. Lee is also one of our UK friends mm -hmm. who is over, I believe, in Malaysia as well, running a school. So it's like we've got this group, and we keep saying we got to make our way over to one of your schools. So we're we're just building a community and just waiting for somebody to invite us over. 2023, maybe? Come over. Well, 
Today we are talking about student-centered coaching. Now, a lot of times we talk about student-centered approaches to education, and it's very often, right, student, set, student, student, student. But then when we have these conversations with our teachers, we're talking about them and their practices and what they're doing in the classroom. And oftentimes students are not part of that conversation. And so today we say, how can we make sure that that conversation around student-focused education is all across the board and part of those conversations that we are having with our teachers as well. So we have two great questions as we normally do. We'll jump in and have some conversation and then we will close things out with our ideas that stick. So I don't know about you all, but I'm looking forward to this conversation. So let's jump into question number one. Inside the principal's office discussion question one. Student-centered coaching involves setting goals and collaborating with both students and other colleagues. What would be some look-fors as leaders in schools to see if student-centered coaching is evident? This is a great question. We always want to make sure that things are actually happening and not just part of conversations or words that we post up on our walls. So Hedrick, I know you just got back from a road trip collaborating with educators. So I'm curious, what are some of the things that you would be looking for? You know, what I find is that we see data as student outcomes. And that's kind of really it. We look at data, we're looking at, that's it. And what I'm missing often, is someone else in the internet echo? Because I am. When I talk, interesting. I don't hear an echo. Okay, well then I'll keep talking. Do <laughs> you right. hear what no, I, I hear? No, I don't. All right, so this is what I'm thinking. Um, we talk about data only in terms of outcomes. And we say data doesn't lie, numbers don't lie, but that's not true. Depending on what question I, or how I ask a question, it frames your answer and that's the data I'm collecting. So I'm asking certain questions and I'm collecting that data, but every student interaction is important. And we don't, the IT world looks at user experience. You know, UX is a big thing. If I go to Nike and I wanna get stuff, I wanna buy a, a certain pair of shoes, they make it so that whatever search parameters I put in, however bad I spell, I'm going to find that shoe because they want me to buy. And we want students to buy in, but we don't take the same care to collect user experience data. We ask them, do you have a friend at school? And those wonderful big adultified questions, you know, do you feel a teacher cares about you? And they say, look, our students have a sense of belonging, but we don't say, why are you so wiggly guys well i'm probably wiggly because i'm 11 and i've been sitting all day listening and writing and listening and writing and listening and writing and that's data that we completely ignore we only see that my students are disengaged <laughs> and so my big takeaway from last week was talk really getting to know students making sure that they have a sense of belonging and having enough of a relationship to know that your brilliant lesson that you actually did, did, so you did all of this Pinterest research and plan this great experience that they hate it and being unafraid to say, why do you hate it? And being unafraid to say, well, let's plan something together. This is our learning target. What can we do? How do you want to show me that you're learning this? And, and, and we really do that. You know, planning with students is like the jam. Hedrick, I love the fact that you said that, you know, numbers don't lie, but it's how we frame the question, right? And oftentimes we we pull what we want to see, right? And so we frame it in a way that if we look great, right? We can ignore certain things and we can just say, no, no, we're, we're doing, we're right on the right track. Um, and that that's a great, a great idea to highlight because those are those difficult conversations that a lot of us don't often want to engage in. So, uh, Nicola, I'm curious, what do you have to add to this? Sorry, did you ask me, you were breaking up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, feel free to jump on it. Yeah, okay, I really like, um, so Hedrick, you, you mentioned belonging, um, and that was something that I was also gonna talk about. So for me as a leader, what I really wanna see when I go into, into a school and, and evidence students coaching is that sense of belonging, is the relationship. If, if you don't have the culture, 
set up in a school for students in terms of coaching and learning, then you may as well forget the rest. So it's all about having that culture, that culture of strong relationships, social and emotional skills between the students and between the students and the teachers. And if you don't have that as a starting point, then you might as well forget the rest. And then the other thing that I really wanted to focus in on was how we how we approach profound learning in schools as well. So if we have if we're gonna have goals for our teachers and we want our teachers to keep getting better and we want their goals to be based on the students and the outcomes of the students, then it's really important that we have a learning culture. And that learning culture has to be so strong. It has to be supported by the leaders in the school and the professional learning has to be given space in the in the timetable and it has to be supported. And as part of that, what I would be looking for are those teacher learning communities. So that th those teacher learning communities are really being given time, space, credibility, training, consistency. And th that's one of the main things that I would be looking for in this. Thank you. I know that's one of the things that I often hear from our staff is that if you're going to want us to do something, can you actually allow, allow us to do it, right? And and then and, and believe in us enough, you know, to to allow us to kind of flush this out and, and to move forward through it. So, uh, Mac, I think it's very important if we're talking about student uh, centered coaching. Uh, the major look for that I have uh, are the conversations that I have with kids when I'm in classrooms. Um, and my number one go-to question is, uh, hey, bud, what are you learning today? You know, and then I go from, you know, if you if you get stuck, is there somewhere where, you know, what do you do when you get stuck? I want to know if kids actually know what they what it is they are supposed to be learning. You know, when you think about athletic coaching, uh, there's no one that's, when you talk to them, they know what skill they're working on. They know what they need to do. They know the purposes of I'm doing this drill because this drill will uh, translate to this when it's time for uh, performance. So I want to know what kids know about their learning. Uh, and a major look for, for me is uh, do they know where they're going? Um, do they know the learning target? And do they understand where they are in relationship to where they're going? Um, and then I want to probe kids and I want to ask them uh, to see if they've been getting feedback. You know, do you know the steps that you need to take to get from where you are to where you're supposed to be? Because that's the art of coaching. The art is real time coaching and feedback. And when a teacher is leaving a kid, they're telling a the kid, okay, your next step is, we're giving them next step feedback to get what your goal is. Your next step is, I want you to work on adding voice to this piece. And you're going to look for places where you can add dialogue between your characters. That's what I want to know. I want to know from the mouth of kids, this is where I'm going. But right now, this is the, this is the rung of the ladder I'm on. And I'm doing these things to get to the next, to the, get to the next level. Thank you, Meg. I, 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 I like the latter thing because that, that is your thing. Uh, but I, I love the asking them what they're learning, you know, the, the why behind it. And so before I jump in, I just want to just say thank you. I saw some people popping into our space here. I saw John. John, you are always here. We do appreciate your uh, constant presence with us. And my good friend, Debbie, you are in our space. So thank you for being here, Debbie. Uh, always love seeing you all here. And so just a reminder, if you are joining us here in this space this morning, it is not a conversation among the four of us, as Mac pointed out at the top of the show. This is a community. This is our village. So feel free to let us know you're here by saying good morning and then hop into the conversation. The questions are not just for us to respond to, but you can also respond and ask your own questions as well. Uh, going back to this first question, for me, I think my look for is are, are the conversations really focused on student performance, right? We There's a lot of conversations around my students aren't doing this, my student, as Hedrick was pointing out earlier, but I'm wondering if the conversations are asking things like, you know, what is it that we want our students to learn and how will we know, you know, that they've learned those things? If they're not getting there, what can we do to make sure that those gaps are being closed? And if they have mastered it, right, as Matt kind of mentioned, where do we go from there? But it's really having conversations around the, our students, our students, our students, and figuring out how do we make sure that they're getting to where they're going. I think a lot of times, right, as we pointed out earlier, the conversations around everything else 
with the exception of what we need to have conversations on. And then we sit back at the end of the year and we're like, well, how come we didn't get to where we wanted to go? Right. Well, because you're looking at the wrong things. They may be feel good conversations. Right. Or they may be venting sessions. Right. Not that we've had any of those ever. Right? But it's like, are we really focused on students? Because if we have student centered goals that we're trying to get to at the end of the year, then we need to have these student centered conversations around what are they doing and how do we know if they're getting there and what can we do to support them along that journey? So I. I, I just tried to recap. I mean, it's always challenging to go at the end because you guys say so many wonderful things. Charles, before we move on to the next question, I know we have a time thing, but there's something that, that Max said that I really, really wanted to bring out. Two act, two things, actually. One, sure. he said, having student, con the, 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 the conversations I'm having with students. And I want to encourage teachers, you know, sometimes we say, oh, I got duty. Oh, I got duty. And take those opportunities to have those kind of conversations. You know, you can't have them in a classroom with a 45 minute block or a 90 minute block. But when you are on the playground, in the lunchroom, you can say, oh my God, hey, how'd y'all like the lesson? And you have a whole different kind of setting. So have those conversations as a teacher so that you can collect that. That's really important data. And the other thing you said was, do the, do the kids know what they're learning? Can we please lose the student will be able to? I am, I mean, we put that on the board. It is for adults. It is not for our students. I usually, and I used to get in trouble for it. I would write it on at the beginning of a unit, then say, what does this mean? And we would break it down and then we would rewrite it. I'd have a student, okay, rewrite it in some language. And, then, and we would all have a group learning target so that they literally knew what yes. they were learning because they talked about it. It was not something that I pulled from my teacher and my standards and wrote on the board to trot out for when I get get, get somebody coming into my classroom to look. So if we can just lose that, that yeah. will be a long way to making sure kids know what they're learning. I love what you just said because I, I love the practice of a learning target being an I can statement. I can mm -hmm. do blah. So kids know by the end of this block of time, or by the end of this week of study, I will be able to do this that I was not able to do um, before. And that getting clear on the learning is so very important that just as adults, we unpack and unwrap standards to get clarity. If they're the ones learning it, there's great value in a kid unpacking and unwrapping the standard so they know what am I gonna know and what am I gonna be able to show by the end of this learning. That's and, ooh, look what I can do. It's such a driver for students. Yeah. Ooh, mama, yeah. look what I can do. Yeah. I can. It's student agency, isn't it? It's all about student agency and students right. co constructing their own goals and their own learning. And they're going to be more passionate about it. They're going to take ownership of it. They're going to want to do it. So being right. really specific about what students are learning and why they are doing it is essential and if that's not happening then we're not teaching our students properly we're not doing it right so yeah absolutely absolutely a uh, great conversation this morning can't believe that we're almost halfway through today's show and i can't go a second further without mentioning the book <laughs> we're on a show entitled inside the principal's office and we were blessed with our co-author Dr. Robert Thornell to write a book entitled Inside the Principal's Office. And just as we use this time to reflect and refine our practice, that is the whole thought process behind this book is 40 weeks of reflective learning. We wanna guide you through an opportunity to weekly reflect and refine your practice centered around several areas. Uh, and so uh, it is on Amazon. It's over a year old. We just celebrated our year anniversary. It's a great book. And I'm not just saying it because my name is like right there and like my picture's like right back there. I'm not saying it because my picture's on it. I'm saying it because it really is good and it's inexpensive and you should invest in your learning. And when adults learn more, kids learn more. So it's all about student achievement go out and get this book. Well, you know what? You don't have to go out and get this book. Just take your cellular apparatus, go to your Amazon account. Cha-ching, here tomorrow. How about that? So let's get into question number two. How many people are having fun? How many people are learning? How many people are thinking, oh, I can do this differently tomorrow? Well, not tomorrow, because it's Sunday, but Monday when I get around kids, I'm gonna do something different. I can coach students in their learning. That's our learning target for today. 
Okay, so let's get into question number two. Inside the principal's office discussion question two. An important element of student-centered coaching is gathering and assessing data surrounding student learning. What are some examples of strong data collection and assessment practices that you can share that support a student-centered coaching model? Mmm, my goddaughter does that. Mmm, when she's thinking, that is such a great uh, question. And today we're going to do something different. So Charles doesn't always have to say, well, y'all said everything and now I don't have anything to say. So Sir Charles, <laughs> We're going to give you first stab at this one. Go. Well, let, let me consult my cellular apparatus. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we, we were talking a little bit before the show, and I, and I absolutely agree with this, is the idea is that data doesn't have to be an assessment, right? You don't have to put a piece of paper in front of your students and say, you know, fill in the bubbles or jump onto this, you know, NWEA, whatever it may be. Like, those are great data points, but I think a lot of times – data points can be collected in all areas. So for example, in my new role, I've been supporting teachers and just ma managing the culture and the climate of their classrooms. And I've had a lot of teachers tell me, well, this isn't happening and this isn't working. And I said, well, have we had conversations with the students, right? And so we sat down with the students just the other day and we ran through this whole activity about what they needed in order to be successful in the classroom, what they needed to feel safe in that space. And then we collected that data and we were starting to construct a classroom, identifying those norms around how we should be operating in this space. And, you know, the teacher was like, wow, it's working. I was like, yeah, because we're getting data points from our students when they're not feeling heard, when they're not feeling involved, when they don't feel safe in a space. And then you're wondering, as we mentioned earlier, why am I disengaged? Why am I, you know, focused on my phone instead of doing the work that I should be doing? There's usually something behind that. And so my big idea is that there's, I, there's opportunities to collect data all over the place. Yes, collect the, the, the big data points, um, right? Formative assessments, summative assessments. I'm not even going to talk about high stakes standardized assessments because I don't like those. Uh, but, you know, the, there's a lot of ways to collect data from your students. Um, but it's not just about, and I, and I just want to say this, it's not just about collecting those points. What are you going to do with them? And so that, that's huge. You can do all the data collection you want, but if you ignore it, right, those conversations I've been having with teachers, if students are saying, hey, I need X, Y, and Z, and you're like, well, that's cool. I'm going to continue doing A, B, and C. Don't be surprised when nothing changes in your classroom. Um, so that's just one point. Con take those opportunities, as Hedrick said earlier, connect with your students, collect the data, and then figure out where am I going to go with this to make an impact in my space. Did that work? Yeah, you did good. You got to <laughs> be, no, just playing. No, you did great. That's like, now I don't have anything to say. <laughs> So, uh, Nicola, would, would you mind jumping in? Yeah, sure. So I totally agree what you just said. Talking to the students about their learning is essential. And what, what I like to do and what I like to ask my teachers to do is, is to actually get the students to bring their, their workbooks and tell me what they've been learning that week and actually talk to me about what they've learned and what that learning experience has been for them that week. And what I want to see is the evidence in the books of that progress. Um, I don't like standardised assessments either. I really don't. Um, so it is all about a formative assessment and the response of teaching for me. Um, I think there's lots of really great data can be gathered with great questioning in class as well. And there's formative assessment strategies that are used in class. Um, but I do, I do really think looking at the learning and the work that the students have produced and the progress that they've made, but getting them to think about it is a fantastic way to point and you can find so much out from that. Hmm. Thank you. Hedra? I, I, I just keep going back to, um, to the student experience. You know, that's one thing that we very often ignore. You mentioned the cellular apparatus. And um, a lot of times, I actually did a podcast a few weeks, few months ago with somebody. They were talking about, you know, yes or no cell phones in the classroom. I have, and I, I, I have teachers saying, I just have such issues with getting my kids to put their cell phones away. Well, 
You remember the game that said, are you smarter than a seventh grader? How about, are you more interesting than a cell phone? <laughs> How about if we, as teachers, and I know teachers, and I get this a lot. Oh yeah, but you're the fun teacher, you know? I just don't have that. Yeah, but you got to. A, a part of being an educator is capturing and capturing the attention and engaging your audience. So whatever your thing is, you have to do it well enough so that kids are more inspired to learn what it is you got for them than to scroll through their cellular apparatus. And I just think that's kind of important and we miss that. And this is, when you talk, talk about collecting data, it's conversations, it's of course the big data points. I will not talk about standardized testing either because Texas has spent $4 billion on standardized testing to two companies, one of which is not even in the country. And I'm wondering what you have from that, except a couple of weeks of really stressful, you know, stressful educational experiences. But <clears throat> what this is data. <laughs> if I'm taught, I, I remember my son was third grade. His teacher had gotten the teacher of the year, and I went and sat in her class once because the two of them didn't. And I just wanted to know what was going on. And I looked and her children were completely compliant. The third graders were sitting crisscross applesauce and they were picking noses and scratching the back of their head. And she was delivering a 20 minute perfectly planned lecture. I'm like, girlfriend, pay attention to the data. Not one of those kids could have told her what she was saying, I'm sure. They were, they were so checked out. They were quiet, they, but they were not engaged. And compliance is not student engagement. So pay attention. Are your kids compliant? Are they playing or doing something else because they're bored? Because you are boring them? Take some ownership of that. And that sounds hard, I know. But sometimes we need to take ownership for, hey, are we boring our kids to death? <laughs> How can we change it? Take them outside and do the lesson. Flip it. Say, here, here's my book. I want you to teach this. What? Yeah, you, you, you understand how this goes. You've been in school for eight years now. Take this lesson and I want you to explain it. I'm gonna give you five minutes. Boss out, can you take a friend? Yes. And then do a wiggle break, do a, a vocabulary. There are ways to make sure that our kids are engaged. And I think like, like I said, board faces are an important data point that we ignore. So collect that data. Yeah, well, I think that you hit on something uh very important because you talked about a teacher doing all the things that teachers are supposed to do in giving a textbook lesson. I think when we talk about assessment, well, not I think, I know that when we talk about assessment, I think that I know that our focus has to change and it can't be a focus on teaching, but it must be a focus on learning. And that is why assessment is so important. Uh, because we can do all the right things uh, from an instructional standpoint. You know, you had the many lessons, the kids were divided, you have them in small groups, they're working independently. Those are all the teacher actions, but if it is not showing up in data, and if kids are not actually learning those things that uh, we know are important, then, then you know, what, what, are, what are we really doing? The focus has to be on learning. Uh, the uh, assessment practice that I think is very important for us to ask ourselves is that we have to ask ourselves this, what are we assessing when it comes to learning? There's so many things that teachers are required to teach and states are saying that there are so many standards. Uh, it becomes very important for school staff, parents and students alike to get really, really clear and identify what is the viable and guaranteed curriculum of this building? What are the things that we are going to ensure that every kid knows per grade and content area before they leave this grade? If I'm a third grade teacher, I have to understand I'm building a better fourth grade teacher, fourth grade kid, and I need to know exactly what are those skills that they have to have, those must have skills when they get to fourth grade. If they don't have them, they're gonna flounder. So our assessment has to be centered around that. And we can't just be weighing the pig just to weigh the pig. We have to uh, not just test and assess everything, but we're, we have to make sure that we are assessing the right things and that we're actually using them to drive conversations with kids and to ensure that they're learning the, the right stuff. 
And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm going to pop in real quick, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, there was mm -hmm. a comment that was on Twitter um, that said, no matter how engaging my lesson is, it's never as interesting as the hot gossip on a text thread. And I would say that. we Engaging lessons, yes. But if my students are engaged, they are not likely to want to pick up their phones. And I've had classes, many, many classes. When you give them the ownership of their learning, they are more interested, even if it's just seeing if so-and-so in the classroom is going to fail. And, you know, uh -huh, see, I knew I was smarter than him. It's not about me being engaging. It, I need to hold their attention for about 10 minutes. Right. So what I give them to do. Right. That's what's going to keep them from wanting to do other things. And if I let them have a voice in that, mm -hmm. then they are. I let, I, one year we were doing graphic design and learning learning basics, really sixth grade coming in. How do you set something up so it looks good on a page? We used Canva and I let them plan a dream party. It was the same skills. It was the same standards. But because how much money I got? As many as much as you want. I'm flying my kids to Hawaii. My friends, we're going to... They didn't want to, mm -hmm. it was much more interesting than what the gossip was on the thread. At least right. for them to get that. So we are giving them so much that we think for me, as opposed to looking at how can they learn this in a way that's yeah. interesting and for real, real world connected. Not yeah. work problem connected, real mm -hmm. world connected. Yeah. And that's that back to that, put the focus on learning and not focus on engaging in, in, uh, on the teaching because that is a adjective that Sometimes we select, oh, this is engaging. But what do the kids have to say? Are the kids engaged? And I go back to the first question that we have. When a kid actually knows what it is they're supposed to be learning and why it is important, one of the mm -hmm. things that I used to say on my campus at the end of every announcement is, you know, I always talked about futuristic. What do you want to be when you grow up? And my comment every day at the end of announcements was, remember, at the end of the day, you need to be one day closer to the thing you want to be when you grow up. So if I can relate what I'm doing in this moment to I'm going to be a doctor one day, and now I also know what I am supposed to be learning, how it's going to help me get there, and I can understand that there's a gap between what I need to know and where I am, I am engaged to make it to that next rung of the ladder and and, and use the feedback that my uh, teacher has given me because it's a greater picture. The picture is beyond this lesson for today. It is how is this usable and valuable to me? How am I using it to set goals? How is it gonna help me uh, uh, meet my goals? And start off with lifestyle. If you mm -hmm. ask kids, this, these, this is an apartment, this is the house, and you know, show them the serious fat crib, and they'll tell you that's where Did I'm you say live. fat crib. We that's still say that. No. You said sell your apparatus. I can say fat crib. Fat crib. I'm gonna write that in my notes. Fat crib. We can still say that in 2022. Girl, I didn't know. <laughs> I did not say I was hep. Okay. MTV <laughs> cribs. This was you show them, you show them the sneakers and the and the car and the and the house, and then you can tell them, baby, that's not Ferrari. That's not Ferrari learning. <laughs> that's not Ferrari learning. Well, we're, th that's not Corvette learning. You know, you want a Ducati? That's not going to get you there. Mm -hmm. And and they they connect. Nobody ever talked to me that way. <laughs> I had a student say that. It's like, yeah, make the connection. You want to be a baller? Then now is where it starts. Mm. So this has been a tremendous conversation, and we are getting to the very end of our show. So we do not. Th there's been a lot, right? We we have thrown out a lot. We've I contemplated a lot. And so we always want to close out with something that sticks, something that you can say, I'm going to walk away. And as Max said, on Monday, when I walk into my space, this is what I am going to do. So we want to share this with you. And sometimes it's just an idea that we had. And today, what we want to do is a resource. What is a resource that you can access as you're diving into the concepts of student-centered coaching? And so we're just going to go around the horn here and each of us drop our own. So I know that as I've been researching the concepts of student-centered teaching, there's a name that continuously pops up, which is Diane Sweeney. Uh, yeah. So definitely check out all of the work, right? All of the yeah. things, because it's not just a book. <laughs> check out all of the work by Diane Sweeney. And there are some blogs out there. Uh, TCEA has a great blog that kind of condenses this if you just want a quick snapshot as you're launching into it. But definitely dive into some of these resources because it reminds us kind of the steps 
of what does student-centered coaching look like, but as well as making sure that we're asking the right questions. As Hedrick pointed out at the very beginning of this show, we focus on those things that we prioritize, right? So are we asking the right questions? Are we looking at the right pieces of information and data? And it reminds us of exactly what questions we should be asking so we can be moving in the right direction. So Nicola, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hedrick, you're next, and then we'll close it out with Matt. Sure, so so my resource that I wanted to mention um, is a book by Dylan William. I mean, check out anything by Dylan William because he's awesome. But he wrote a book called Leadership for Teacher Learning, um, creating a culture where all teachers can improve so that all students succeed. And my, my big takeaway from that book is every teacher can improve. If you're not good enough, and we can always be better. And if we want to have that focus on um, student-centered learning, then that's the that's the culture and the approach that we have to have to support in our teachers to continue to focus on their own practice. Oh, just go. Okay. <laughs> I um again, we are collecting a lot of, of student outcome data. We are collecting our campus our recurring performance assessment data, we're collecting our curriculum assessment data. What we are often missing is every interaction and every interaction tells us something. Every face in that classroom tells you something. If I go over 10 to 15 minutes, my kids are going to start to check out because that's about how long I've got to capture their attention, get them to where they need to be so that they can work on whatever it is they need to work on. So collect, consider collecting data in real time. All of my kids are wiggly, it's fifth period. How about we go take a walk and come back? Five minutes is not going to mess you up, but it might save you a couple of office referrals. So collect all of that data and use it, and prioritize it as much as you do your CAs and your RPA data. Okay. I would say that the uh, resource that is great for me is learning by doing this is an awesome resource and as you can see i read and reread and write and i do all kinds of things in this book i've read and reread and uh it goes back to what i've said uh earlier in in order for us to coach kids we have to know exactly what is most important in our coaching so uh we have to identify what is essential that we can't spend all of our time coaching kids in everything but what is most essential for every kid to know at each grade level what is that guaranteed and viable curriculum uh and learning by doing is a great text it does not necessarily uh you know there's not student centered learning in the title but if we understand the concepts and understand the importance of identifying what is actually essential for kids to learn I think that that is where we start and that is where we ground our work. Uh, and then we layer this coaching concept on top of that. You're on mute. <laughs> yeah, you're on mute. <laughs> you know, it, it, it happens, I guess. You would think that we'd all be masters of this by now. I know. Um, so I, I think this, like I was saying, this is was a, even though you couldn't hear me, it was a great conversation. Um, you know, and it's just, again, we, we talk so much about focusing things on students. And, and I just want to connect this back as we close out these thoughts, you know, that Nicola pointed out that it's not about teachers being bad at their job, right? And a lot of times I think that when we come in as coaching, that's how teachers feel. You're telling me that what my what I'm doing is wrong, but instead of having those conversations, if you want your students to do better, if you want great things to happen in your classroom, what's working and not working and kind of scaling that back because at the end of the day, I don't know of any teacher. And if I do, then I tell them to leave. So that's why I don't know of them. But if you don't want any, I don't know of any teacher who doesn't want their students to be successful. Right. Right. At the end of the day, that's what they all want. And so let's have conversations around students and what they need to be successful in the classroom because those great teachers, those who are willing to learn, those who are willing to do better, will adapt their practices to make sure those things happen. And again, if they're saying, no, I don't care, well, then go somewhere. Bye bye. Can I say one thing, Charles? Please. I think I alluded to this. We have to make sure that we have a focus on learning. And I think you just hit on something that's very important. Kids learn more when teachers learn more. So our focus on learning should not just be on the kids learning, 
But what mm -hmm. we have to understand is every day we enter our building, we you've not arrived. You don't know it all that we're all learning. And the key to student, the keys to student learning more is having a staff member that has a focus on their learning as well, because uh, things change, standards change, uh, rigor increases. And so as the adults, we have to come in every day. We have to have our educator hat on, but we have to be able to be agile enough to know when to take it off and when to put on our learner hat. When we lay data down on the table, it tells us what kids got it and what kids didn't get it. But it also identifies uh, needs for professional development. It also identifies who are the experts at this skill. And let me sit in that class. Let them come model something for me. Let me go over and watch. So the focus on learning is uh, it's a it's a it's a culture of learning. It's a focus on learning for everyone that's in the building. Absolutely. Well, I want to just say thank you, uh, as always, Matt, for sharing the space with me. I always enjoy being here with you. But definitely a thank you to our two guests today. Yes. Yeah. And Nicola, we appreciate you. And then, of course, everyone who has joined us this morning. Uh, I know that we were having some some tech issues of pulling all the comments up, but we will definitely go back and connect with you. So thank you for being in this space. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us again on October 29th. And I know you're like, wait, you always do the first and third Saturday. The 29th is like the fifth Saturday. It's one of those weird ones. Uh, but we, we missed out on an episode. So we definitely want to come back. And we're going to modify the remainder of this year a little bit because we know we're entering into the holiday season. So we will have one show in November, one show in December, and then we will see you back in January. Uh, but our episode on the 29th is talking about design thinking, which we were hoping to get launched uh, two weeks ago, but we are revisiting this. And so we want to ask our guests today if they can pay it forward with a question that they would like to learn more about when thinking about design, well, design thinking. I just did a workshop on this for my um, <clears throat> for my district yesterday. And so my question is, how can you use design thinking across content? We often think of it as maybe the science or maybe just a CTE class. But how can you use design thinking in core subjects? Thank you. Nicola? Um, my my question is related to curriculum, so link a little bit to what Hedrick just said, but how can we use the design thinking to make our curriculum relevant to students that are sitting in front of us? Because that's different in every school. So thank you so much. I, I love this idea about using it across different uh, curriculums and focusing it on a content area and then making it relevant to our students. We just talked about today making sure that students are engaged and they're involved in their own learning. So how do we make it relevant? So look at all the connections we're making. <laughs> well, again, thank you all. Mac, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share before we jump on? Uh, it's just always great being here in this space with my BFF from Chicago, uh, Charles. Uh, thank you so much, uh, guest, for being here with us today. You've made our day not bitter. You've made it better by being here with us today. Uh, and we thank the guy in the back pulling all the strings and grabbing all the levers that make this happen and has made it happen for 31 episodes. We appreciate uh, all that Wallace uh, does to make Inside the Principal's Office a great success. And uh, I can't wait to see you all again on October the 29th. All right. See you then. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Thanks for watching and learning with us at School Rubric with educators from across the globe. For more access to articles, magazines, podcasts, live episodes, our international school directory, courses, and more, visit us at schoolrubric.org. Thank you.